probably even more more it's probably even more so uh, in the United States but this is a this statistics maybe nine months old um, but 19 percent of American internet users use Twitter okay so uh, actually I'm gonna let Rob talk about the big idea All right. thank you all right so the idea behind uh, Twistery itself was kind of came from uh, Marion Jensen, and what he and several of us had experienced was attending various conferences um, where there was a, a Twitter back channel, basically um, communication happening behind the scenes, um, and so you know people that were attending sessions could tweet about whatever it was that the the people were talking about. I've been in some conferences where I've, in effect, attended about three sessions at the same time because I'm talking to the other people that are in the other sessions and they're telling me what they're saying. I even asked a question in another session that I wasn't even attending. And so it, there, there's some interesting communication that goes on back there. So Marion was actually attending a conference remotely. He wasn't there, but he was watching this discussion that was happening. And uh, the idea came that, uh, you know, you could be able, you could you could write a book this way you could you could do all these different interactions based on people talking you know at the same time but in different locations and then you know somehow the magic came to him that uh, that you could actually reproduce history this way do historical reenactments and so um yeah, that's the that's that's the basics behind it. Um, and historians and, and and teachers have been doing reenactments for for a long time, but this kind of takes just a little bit different spin on it, where it, it does it a little bit more more virtually. And so um, the learning objectives we got up there, you can actually learn doing this stuff. Um, the the idea here. Um, to make it actually instructionally sound and not just interesting. I mean, we, there are people that will get together and reenact a, you know, battle, uh, some revolutionary war battle, but they do it for fun, not necessarily for the learning piece of it. Or sometimes they do actually study quite a bit to learn about it. But some of the benefits that you can get from actually going through and doing the research and presenting this um, as, uh, as a reenactor is that uh, you're dealing with primary documents, primary sources, things like journals um, and uh, newspaper. Newspapers are generally secondary sources, but they're still original to the time that are going to give you an idea of what was happening, what the, what the opinion was at the time. And so by deconstructing and putting back together this picture of history based on the, um, the people who actually lived it, rather than reading two paragraphs about it in a history book and whatever slant that author decided to put on a particular issue, um, you can actually experience um, something by understanding and putting into a small number of words, 140 characters, the essence of what was actually said. And that's, that's easier said than done. It's actually it's pretty difficult to do, having been someone that's done several of these reenactments. Um, and then the other piece of it is, is the time factor and understanding a little bit better how um, the context actually fits into place. Um, earlier this year, there was a, a reenactment of the um, some pioneers that came across um, across the, the plains to out west. And uh, since the time period was the same, the time of year, you'd experience similar type of weather. And so you could you remember, okay, beginning of April, it's kind of cold and wet outside. And then the pioneers would be tweeting about how it's cold and wet outside. And it kind of connects you to, um, to what's happening a little bit better. As well as experiencing it just in the real time, <clears throat> uh, you know some of the southern soldiers as they're marching up from Virginia up to up to Pennsylvania. Uh, you know it takes them a couple weeks to get there, and so every day they're talking about how many miles they went that day, and so that time makes a little bit more sense to you. Not just you know somehow they magically appeared at the other place. You know they're not flying on Harry Potter brooms or something. They're at, they're walking, and so you get a literal understanding of how long it actually took them to walk over that period of time. And so um, people that watch the reenactments that don't necessarily participate in the research, they'll get some of that. They're going to get 
you know, exposure to, you know, information that came from those primary sources. And they'll also get um, the understanding of the time that was involved, not necessarily the opportunity to to do the actual deconstruction of those primary sources and deciding what's important to put in. And so there is some benefit, but it's, it's obviously going to be a, a stronger, um, you know, instructional component if you're actually creating the content rather than just um, following it. So, and, and just something to add to this before we jump to the next slide is that um, really the, the idea behind, um, behind using Twitter at all, uh, for, for all of us, we, um, Marion, Rob, and I, I think we all had a similar experience with Twitter, um, just, and I'm just backing up just to, just to kind of um, share the fact that we all really thought it was pretty dumb. Um, we, we really didn't see any value in, in Twitter. Um, and so, uh, do any of you? yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, does any, does anyone use Twitter here at all? Okay. Maybe a couple people. Okay. So, so basically, um, when we start, we all started out individually trying out these different tools and I, but then we kind of compared notes and we all really, the first couple of tries with Twitter, we just thought, this is the dumbest thing in the world. Um, why would I just tell everyone, like, you know, I had a sandwich for lunch today, um, you know, who cares? And, and, and so it was not until we realized that there was the potential to have, um, to kind of represent people, not necessarily ourselves, but to represent other um for example, historical figures, that it sort of sank in that, okay, this, this actually might be kind of interesting. So the simplicity of Twitter has some advantages, certainly, over, say, Facebook, although you could do this kind of thing with Facebook. Um, but the idea that you're just broadcasting out, that you have these characters that, that you can represent through these different Twitter accounts. So literally, we would set up a Twitter account for uh, you know, f for Abraham Lincoln, we'd set up a Twitter account for some of the generals. Um, you're kind of staging this this reenactment, how, and and you're, you're, the goal is really to um, to not only represent the you know the thirty thousand foot level. This is what happened during this reenactment, but also to really get into some of the the finer details of of people. Uh, who recorded maybe in their journals or letters some 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 pretty specific details of the day by day kinds of events and Twitter does a good job of that because um, you know some of the tweets that we did Rob um, was was uh, one of the authors for the Battle of Gettysburg and some of the tweets that I saw coming out of that were basically like um, you know had beans for breakfast and and, and it kind of just it seems kind of um, maybe uh, unimportant, but then you you put enough of the smaller trivial facts together, and you start to really get a, m a much richer picture of what really what what it was really like to to um, what was the experience like for someone who was in the trenches um, preparing for the Battle of Gettysburg, for example. Just to expand on the beans for breakfast thing that he mentioned. Um, that may not sound interesting in and of itself, but uh, when you take, you know, the mundane, this is our rations for today, and then actually combine it with uh, every day, you start understanding this is what happened every day, but then special things would happen, and something out of the ordinary would happen, and something related to just what food you're eating actually becomes a pretty big deal. Uh, for example, when, the, uh, when they were just about to do a long march, They'd cook up about three days' worth of rations. Instead of eating the normal amount of beans or flour or whatever they normally ate, they'd eat about three or four days' worth, and then they wouldn't eat for three or four days. Uh, and, then, and then there was one part where uh, some of the soldiers, some of the, some of the rebels, they had this rebel yell that they would do before they attacked. And so they would scream like the most ridiculous, crazy like out of control scream that you've ever heard and it actually had a pretty good effect on the Yankees they went running when they heard that and so there was one time where uh, 
they saw this camp up ahead and so they started doing their rebel yell getting ready to go up and attack by the time